Welcome back to the deep dive. Um, for this deep dive, we're, uh, we're taking a trip back in time to the early days of the UFO phenomenon. Oh. Using this incredible collection of declassified U.S. government documents you provided. Right. It's fascinating stuff. Yeah. Mostly from the early 1950s dealing with sightings and official investigations. Wow. I'm excited to dig in and see what we can uncover. It's a treasure trove of information, that's for sure. Yeah. And... What makes these documents so valuable mm -hmm. is that they offer us a window into the government's thinking mm -hmm. at a time when the UFO phenomenon was first emerging on the national stage. Right. It's one thing to read about Roswell and the public frenzy in those days. Yeah. But to actually see how the government was internally reacting. Right. What they were prioritizing. That's where things get really interesting. For sure. And, you know, it's post-World War II. America, the atomic age has just begun. Mm -hmm. The Cold War is simmering. Yeah. So there's this backdrop of anxiety yes. already permeating society. Absolutely. And that context is crucial. Yeah. You can't separate these early UFO investigations from the geopolitical realities of the time. Right. The possibility that these unexplained sightings could be linked to Soviet technology. Oh. That mm -hmm. was a major concern for the U.S. military. Makes sense. Yeah. But before we dive into the government's response, let's talk about some of the early sightings themselves. Okay. What kind of reports were they getting? Well, a lot of the early reports, particularly in the late 1940s, okay. describe these strange, luminous objects, often green in color, oh. that were being observed primarily over New Mexico. Okay. They were dubbed green fireballs. Okay. And... They really captured the attention of Project Sign, mm -hmm. one of the Air Force's first official attempts to investigate UFOs. Green fireballs yeah. sounds almost whimsical. Right. But I'm guessing there was a lot of debate about what they actually were. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Initially, many assumed they were just meteors. Okay. But then the Air Force brought in Dr. Lincoln La Paz to analyze the reports. He was a renowned meteor expert from the University of New Mexico mm -hmm. and had actually been tasked with investigating the Trinity nuclear test site debris. Oh, wow. So they called in the big guns for this. Yeah, they did. What did Dr. La Paz make of these green fireballs? His analysis was fascinating. Okay. He concluded that these green fireballs were very unlikely to be meteors. Hmm. He pointed to their trajectory. Yeah. Many were seen traveling horizontally, which is unusual for meteors. Okay. Their slow speed and the fact that many witnesses reported them as completely silent. Huh. He even used his knowledge of ballistics and triangulation. Wow. Based on witness accounts to estimate their size and speed. Wait, so no sonic booms, no fiery trails, just these silent green orbs cruising across the sky? Pretty much. That does sound strange for meteors. Exactly. And you have to remember, this is Dr. Love has a leading expert in his field saying this. Yeah. His conclusion, which he presented to the Air Force, uh -huh. added a significant layer of mystery to these sightings. That definitely puts things in a different light. For sure. So we have these unexplained green fireballs. The public is getting understandably curious, and the government is starting to take notice. Right. What happens next? Well, the Air Force under Project Sign continued to investigate. Okay. But it seems there was a growing divide mm -hmm. between those who entertained the possibility that these objects might be extraterrestrial in origin right. and those who were more skeptical. I can imagine that debate getting pretty heated, especially with the Cold War paranoia in the background. Absolutely. And it's reflected in the documents. Yeah. You see memos going back and forth. Yeah. With some officials expressing concern about the potential for these sightings to be advanced. Soviet aircraft. Right. While others urged a more cautious approach, advocating for further investigation before jumping to conclusions. So even within the government, there was no clear consensus on how to interpret these sightings. Right. And as Project Sign progressed and more reports came in, mm -hmm. not just of green fireballs, but of disc-shaped objects. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Strange lights. And even what one document describes as a lavender-colored parachute. A lavender-colored parachute? Yeah, it's in there. Okay. The Air Force seemed to become more focused on debunking these reports than actually investigating them. Trying to maintain control of the narrative, perhaps. Possibly. Yeah. The official stance, at least publicly, was that most, if not all, of these sightings could be explained away as misidentified natural phenomena, weather balloons, or even hoaxes. Okay. However, the documents you provided reveal a much more complex story. Interesting. There are internal memos expressing frustration with the lack of conclusive explanations uh -huh. and hints of disagreement between different agencies about how to handle the situation. It sounds like they were walking a tightrope. Yeah. Trying to reassure the public 
while grappling with something they didn't fully understand themselves. Precisely. Yeah. And that tension, that struggle to reconcile what they were seeing with what they believed to be possible. Mm. That's what makes these documents so fascinating. Yeah, I can see that. It's almost like they were caught between wanting to dismiss it all as nonsense and acknowledging that something truly strange was happening. Yeah, and that internal conflict really comes through in some of the memos you highlighted. Yeah. For instance, there's one from the FBI. Okay. Where they're discussing how to standardize reporting procedures for unconventional aircraft. Uh. They even debate whether to use the term unconventional aircraft at all because it might legitimize the idea of UFOs. That's fascinating. So oh. even if they weren't openly admitting to a potential threat, they were definitely creating systems to deal with it. Exactly. And it wasn't just procedural stuff either. Okay. There's a real sense in some of these documents that they were actively trying to understand what was going on, not just brush it under the rug. Mm -hmm. You see this particularly with the reports of electromagnetic interference accompanying some of these sightings. You mean the whole UFOs messing with car engines and radios thing? Right. That always seemed a little far-fetched to me. It does sound like something out of a movie, I'll admit. Yeah. But there are multiple instances in these files where witnesses describe their vehicles stalling, uh -huh. lights flickering, or radios going haywire during or immediately after a UFO sighting. Really? In fact, there's a report from a pilot who claimed his aircraft's instruments went completely haywire while he was tracking a strange object on radar. Wow, that's more than just a flickering light bulb. Right. Do they have any theories about what might be causing this interference? Well, that's where things get really intriguing. Okay. Keep in mind, we're talking about the early 1950s here. Yeah. Our understanding of electromagnetic phenomena was still evolving. And many of the technologies we take for granted today simply didn't exist. So they couldn't just chalk it up to some advanced radar system or something like that? Not really. Okay. Some scientists suggested it could be related to atmospheric ionization uh -huh. caused by the objects themselves, but that was pure speculation. Yeah. The truth is they were really grasping at straws. Some of the documents even speculate about a potential link to the Soviets' early nuclear testing, which shows just how high the stakes were in their minds. It's like they were trying to fit these square pegs of UFO sightings and weird electromagnetic effects into the round hole of their existing knowledge. A very apt analogy. Yeah. And when those pieces didn't fit, they often defaulted to either dismissing the reports as unreliable or attributing them to some unknown natural phenomenon. Okay. But what's really striking is how often that explanation seems to be contradicted by the evidence they themselves were gathering. Can you give me an example? Sure. Mm. You mentioned the New Haven sighting earlier. Yeah. It's a classic case of multiple credible witnesses, including that police officer, observing this bright spherical object hovering silently for an extended period. Right. Now, the Air Force ultimately dismissed this as a weather balloon. But? But the meteorological data from that day doesn't support that conclusion. Okay. And what's even more interesting is that one of the witnesses, uh, a Yale scientist, oh, wow. claimed to have seen the object through a telescope. Interesting. And described it as having a metallic surface with portholes. Portholes. Yeah. That sounds a little too sci-fi, even for me. I know it's a detail that really jumps out. Yeah. But whether you believe it or not, the fact that it was documented in an official memo mm -hmm. suggests that at least some within the government were taking these reports seriously. Right. Even if they weren't ready to embrace the most outlandish possibilities. So what about the extraterrestrial hypothesis? Was that ever seriously considered by those in power? That's a question that historians and UFO enthusiasts have been debating for decades. Yeah. Publicly, the government maintained a stance of skepticism. Okay. Often framing the whole UFO phenomenon as a product of mass hysteria or Cold War anxieties. Right. But in the documents you shared, you see glimpses of a more nuanced picture. What do you mean? Well, there's a fascinating memo from a high-ranking Air Force official written in 1952. He expresses his belief that some of these UFO sightings could indeed be extraterrestrial spacecraft. Wow. He even outlines a plan for how the Air Force should approach the issue. Okay. Advocating for more scientific study and a greater degree of transparency with the public. That's incredible. And what happened to this plan? Did it gain any traction? Unfortunately, not really. Mm -hmm. The memo seems to have been largely ignored or perhaps even suppressed. Wow. It was only declassified decades later. Wow, that's a real what-if moment in history. It really is. Yeah. It makes you wonder how the public might have reacted if the government had been more open to the possibility of extraterrestrial visitation back then.
it certainly would have changed the conversation. Right. But even with the government's attempts to downplay the UFO phenomenon, it clearly captured the public's imagination. Absolutely. Yeah. And it wasn't just the mystery and the fear. Right. But also this sense of wonder that we might not be alone in the universe. The documents you provided are full of examples of ordinary people writing letters to the government, really? sharing their own sightings theories, yeah. and even offering their help in unraveling the mystery. It's like the UFO phenomenon tapped into this primal human need to explore the unknown. Yeah. To push the boundaries of what we believe to be possible. Exactly. And that's what continues to fascinate us about this topic even today. Right. It's a reminder that there are still so many unanswered questions out there, so much that we don't know about the universe and our place within it. It's really striking how these documents reveal the human side of this whole UFO saga. You know, mm -hmm. it's not just about objects in the sky. It's about people wrestling with the unknown, grappling with their beliefs and trying to make sense of something that challenges their understanding of the world. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. These documents aren't just dry government reports. They're filled with personal stories, anxieties, and a sense of wonder that transcends time. And that's what makes this deep dive so compelling. It's a glimpse into a moment in history when the boundaries of what we thought we knew were being pushed and the government, along with everyday citizens, were trying to figure out what it all meant. It also makes you realize that the questions we're asking today about UFOs, about the possibility of extraterrestrial life, right. they're not new. Right. These questions have been swirling around for decades, fueled by these very sightings and the government's response to them. And even though Project Sign eventually evolved into Project Grudge and later Project Blue Book, uh -huh. which ultimately concluded there was no evidence of a threat or extraterrestrial involvement, right? the questions haven't gone away. Yeah. In fact, in recent years, the government has seemed more open to acknowledging that there are unexplained aerial phenomena they're still investigating. It feels like we're coming full circle back to that same point of uncertainty and intrigue that's so evident in these early documents. I'm curious, looking at these documents as a whole, yeah. what stands out to you as the most compelling piece of the puzzle? That's a great question. Um, for me, it's the recurring theme of electromagnetic interference. Yeah. I find it particularly intriguing because it suggests a level of interaction between these objects in our world that goes beyond simple visual sightings. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they couldn't explain it with the technology of the time raises some really interesting questions. Yeah, Was it a natural phenomenon we still don't understand? Mm. Or was it something more? It's definitely one of those threads that makes you want to keep pulling to see where it leads. Did what it about you? What's resonating with you from all of this? I think for me, it's the sense of possibility that permeates these documents. Yeah. Yes, there's fear and uncertainty, uh -huh. but there's also a genuine sense of wonder and a desire to understand the unknown. Right. It reminds us that even in the face of something potentially unsettling, human, curiosity can prevail. Right. And that's a powerful message, I think. Absolutely. And it makes me think about the documents you provided, those pieces of history you brought to light. Yeah. What sparked your interest in this topic? What, what questions were you hoping to answer through this deep dive? I think, like many people, I've always been fascinated by the idea of the unknown of what might lie beyond our planet. Yeah. And these documents offer such a unique perspective on that question. Mm -hmm. They take us back to a time when the government was grappling with these very issues, trying to make sense of something that defied easy explanation. Yeah. I guess I was hoping to get a glimpse into that process to see how those in power approached the UFO phenomenon right. and to perhaps gain some insight into the enduring mystery that continues to fascinate us today. Well, I think we've achieved that and more. Yeah. We've dug into the details of early sightings, explored the government's investigations and internal debates, and even touched on the enduring legacy of these events. Yeah. But as with any good deep dive, I suspect this is just the beginning of your exploration. I have a feeling you're right. Yeah. And I hope this has encouraged you to keep digging, keep asking questions, and keep looking up at the sky with a sense of wonder and curiosity. Yeah. Who knows what other secrets are waiting to be uncovered? Exactly. So to you listening, what stands out to you from all of this? What do you find most compelling about these cases? And what questions are you left with after this journey through declassified history? Yeah. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Keep exploring. And until next time, happy deep diving. <laughs>